for those of you that are on the aisles, I imagine there's going to be more and more people coming in as, throughout the afternoon. If, if possible, if you can consider moving uh, inward towards the seats so that as the people coming in, they don't have to disturb uh, you guys to get a seat. I think we're going to get started. Hope you all had a great lunch. Hope you had enough coffee to stay awake. Uh, you're not going to have any problems staying awake, though, with Dr. Tim Fong here. He's a very energetic, engaging speaker. Dr. Timothy Fong is a professor of psychiatry at the Semmel Institute for Neuroscience and Human Behavior at UCLA. He is the co-director of the UCLA Gambling Studies Program, as well as the director of the UCLA Addiction Psychiatry Fellowship a one-year program designed to provide a leading-edge clinical and research training experience. Dr. Fong's research interests include gambling disorder, behavioral addictions, medication-assisted treatment, and improving quality of treatment for addictive disorders. Please welcome me in welcoming Dr. Timothy Fong. Thank you, Jeff. Good afternoon. And first, let's give another round of applause for uh, Jeff for putting all this together. Jeff is a, a shining example of what our medical school can do here. He's graduating next month from medical school, so we're really excited for that. We're really excited that he's taken time to create this thing. So first off, I want people to say, wait, he's a gambling guy, he's a drug guy. What does he know about cannabis? Well, I'm approaching this as an addiction psychiatrist, and our main goal as addiction psychiatry is not only to do no harm, but to reduce harm and provide solutions. And that's really what I wanted to provide here in the next 20 minutes or so. First, um, here's an example of what we're talking about. So I took this out of my uh, shelf this morning, stuffed it in my bag, and my, my kids are like, Dad, where are you going with that? I'm, you know, I'm going to go do a talk on marijuana. But here's an example where I'll put this slide up when we do talks for high school students or college students. I'll just do a very clear example of true or false. And these are the things that happen here that we start off with. And these are the five premises I want us to think about. Cannabis is harmless. No one dies from cannabis overdose. Cannabis is not addicting. Cannabis does not have a withdrawal syndrome. Cannabis can treat other addictions. Now, we all have our answers in our head. Some of it will be mostly true, mostly false, partly true, partly false. But what I really want to leave us to is that these are the things that addiction psychiatry, these are the things we're most concerned about. And this is the areas of the knowledge and research gap that we need to know more about. Because again, when you have something that's grown in the ground and you put it out here, how can something as simple as this be as powerful for those five uh, concepts? So with that, we start with, again, a quick tour. Cannabis use disorder, and we heard a little bit about from Dr. Cooper, but it's more than just that. Cannabis-related disorders in our DSM-5 are really looking at cannabis use disorder, cannabis <coughs> intoxication, cannabis withdrawal and other substance use disorders that were related to cannabis. First, I really want to highlight, when we work with folks clinically, cannabis intoxication, it's a big deal. We tend to think of it as a passing thing, it's not that uh, major, but we see men and women all the time coming into our emergency rooms, into our hospital, and into our clinics with significantly problems. Problems related to anxiety, motor coordination, all sorts of things happening directly after using cannabis. So that one of that myths that you say, no one dies from cannabis use, no fatalities. Well, that's partly true. Now, although it has a very high therapeutic window where people don't die from any intoxication, people do die when they're under the influence of cannabis. Car accidents, jumping from bridges, developing a psychotic state, and uh, uh, befalling all sorts of tragic accidents. So that's number one we want to leave you with, this idea of intoxication. Also for our medical students and trainees in the room, the idea that cannabis intoxication has a wide variety of presentations, physical, psychological. And at the end of the day, one of the things we have to point to is that we don't have wonderful, easy to use tools that can really distinguish intoxication from cannabis versus other drugs of abuse. So we really have to look at that moving forward. But I really want to highlight what we now call cannabis use disorder or addiction. DSM-5 has merged cannabis abuse and cannabis dependence into a single category called cannabis use disorder. 
Now, I put this up here as an example of how much work we have to do. So to diagnose someone with cannabis use disorder or addiction, it's two out of these 11 criteria to be met over the last 12 months. So that means that the story for men and women when they show up in the treatment is going to be a wide variety of different cases. Some patients will show up with mainly tolerance and withdrawal, while others will show up with craving and inability to stop. And so this is the thing we need to know so much more about, that the story of men and women who develop cannabis use disorder is not the same. And as clinicians, to help screen for it, to identify and treat it, with so much more information is necessary. Number one, we saw this a little bit earlier ago about how the lifetime risk of developing addiction to cannabis is about 9%. Now, I study gambling. I study odds. And if I said to a high school senior, if you start using cannabis, there's a 1 out of 10% chance that you will develop a psychiatric disorder that is harmful, causes suffering, and could really ruin your life and career. Are those odds you want to... Uh, get into? Is that a game you want to join? Obviously with heroin, when we think about 23% of the time, or nicotine 32% of the time, these are huge numbers. But again, 9% is low, but it's not zero. That means from the very first time a person touches cannabis, there is a significant chance that they could develop this disease of cannabis use disorder. So again, we saw this slide earlier about how present, but there's a little bit more depth to this slide I want to go into is that most of the times cannabis use disorder wasn't exactly the number one reason they came in. It was buried among the other things. And one of the things that we see time and time and again, that people don't call us and say, I want to get off of cannabis. They call us and say, I want to get off alcohol, I want to get off cocaine, I want to get off opiates. And along the way in doing the screening, we identify that they have cannabis use disorders. So one of my first big take home points is that when they call to see me, they want to get off addictions. But when they see any other healthcare provider, they're saying, I can't sleep. I have depression. I have anxiety. I have difficulty with pain. But buried underneath that may actually be a cannabis use disorder. So again, in terms of significance, when we're talking about national prevalence, again, 2% of folks 18 years and older, that's a big number. 65 years and older, this is a huge area that we will see over the next 20 years greatly expand. And so we really need to know a lot more about that. All right, so we heard a little bit more about cannabis withdrawal. We heard some data about uh, how to address it. In the DSM-5, this is the first time that that handbook actually said we recognize this as a diagnosable condition. Now, no one's going to die from cannabis withdrawal, but when you go through it, it's very, very unsettling. I saw a patient just yesterday who described he cannot get more than seven days off of cannabis without going back to using he described, I can't sleep, I get irritable, I have anxiety, I get these zaps in my fingers, and my head can't stop thinking about cannabis. I can't function. That's terrible. That's very, very difficult. He says to me, Doc, what do you have in your toolbox to give me that will get me through withdrawal? I don't have anything. Nothing FDA approved. We have some stuff related to so some science and research, but we really don't have any of that. <coughs> Flip side, if I ever remove the top heading in that slide, and you're working in a primary care clinic and your patient shows up with those symptoms, or you're in an emergency room setting and they show up with those symptoms, irritability, nervousness, sleep difficulty, decreased appetite, your first thought isn't cannabis withdrawal. It's going to be something else. It's going to be pneumonia. It's going to be abuse of other drugs. It might be they have some sort of viral illness. And part of our mission today is really to get into the consciousness of all of us in the UCLA health system that cannabis withdrawal cannabis use disorder and that cannabis use is very, very prevalent. And so that's what we know about it, but we know so little about what happens not only when it fades away, but what happens three months down the road. Is there a protracted abstinence syndrome? Is there a protracted withdrawal syndrome? So much that we need to know. So here's what we have for this addiction to cannabis. For men and women who come in with that disorder of cannabis use disorder, what do we have in our addiction toolbox that meaningfully help them? In 2017, we have incredible technology. Imagine the things that we can do online. Imagine all the things that we've created, these inventions. But this is our toolbox. We have no FDA-approved medications to treat cannabis use disorder. We have a wide variety of psychotherapy options that seem to help, and they're similar to what we do for alcohol or cocaine or opiate use disorders. But not one form of psychotherapy is specifically better heads and shoulders above anything else for cannabis. 
We have a variety of 12-step support group, marijuana anonymous groups that work very differently than AA or NA or OA or Gamblers Anonymous, but certainly not as well developed as some of the other 12-step support groups. So in other words, what we have scientifically is really nothing so specific, so wonderful that it works for cannabis use disorder. So the way I like to describe it is that it's just like 1950, and we're trying to get to the moon. We have the technology, we have the ideas, but we haven't crafted the actual plan to put that together. So what I have here is a very simple checklist for clinicians and any healthcare providers of what I think clinicians need to know and equip themselves right now to be better able to handle cannabis use disorder, to be better able to understand what cannabis is and isn't. So number one, it really needs to start with screening for cannabis use at every visit. To put that in with alcohol and tobacco and screening for suicide because it is that important. Number two, I like to explore the relationship with cannabis with patients. I don't like to say, you don't use cannabis, you're not addicted to marijuana, are you? You wouldn't use the devil's weed, would you? That's going to be putting people at bay. I like to say very openly, tell me about your relationship with cannabis. And I find that is much more open because then I'm going to be able to help distinguish someone who's using it for fun versus someone who's using it for sleep and anxiety, someone who's using it under self-medication, someone who has an unhealthy relationship. Addiction is about avoidance. Addiction is about self-medicating. Addiction is about harm. When I say it very clearly, if your use of cannabis is bringing harm to your life, if it's reducing your quality of life, then it probably is problematic. It probably does fall into the spectrum of cannabis use disorder. Then we need to know a lot more about our knowledge base of how cannabis impacts mental health, both positive and negative. And as physicians, we can go through medical school here, we can go through residency here, and we can get very little training on cannabis, how it's prescribed, what it's good for, what it's not, and the culture. So here in Los Angeles, we have at least three to four amazing conventions and conferences every year about the cannabis culture, HempCon, things that happen down in the Los Angeles Convention Center. These are fascinating places where I think medical folks need to learn more about. We certainly need to do more in teaching our medical students and our residents about cannabis. But I have a very simple model, and this is very clear. No cannabis exposure for under the age of 21. That's my belief. The science tells us repeatedly, very clear, if you're under the age of 21 and you expose yourself to this, increased risk for addiction, increased risk for cognitive damage and harm moving forward. So that's it. So I say to my kids, no cannabis for you until you're 21. Let's wait till your frontal lobes develop. And so those are really what we're looking at. Here's the roadmap of what I think as addiction psychiatry we need to look at. We need to look at number one, what is the best prevention strategy to prevent addiction, to prevent cannabis use disorder? Because again, we're all in agreement that cannabis use disorder is a terrible thing, is a horrible thing. Prevention is our number one strategy. But is the prevention just say no? We know that didn't work. Is it prevention to say, let kids try a little bit? We know that doesn't work. Is it prevention to give them more education and information in the schools when that actually then reduces perception of harm? That hasn't worked. Number two, as an addiction specialist, I need to know more how to treat cannabis withdrawal. Take this seriously. For a long time, we would teach our medical students and residents, it's not that bad. It's no big of a deal. They can't die from it. We need to reverse that thinking because cannabis withdrawal is serious and it does cause suffering. Can there be a medical treatment for cannabis use disorders? A medication, uh, an infusion of some various medications, some sort of electrical device, something that might actually treat that disease of addiction. I like to say it very clearly for folks when they struggle with saying, Doc, I don't want to take a medication for my addiction because I'm just replacing one drug for another. A drug is something you take in your body that changes your body's organs and how it functions, but a medication is a drug that restores normal functioning. That's what we need to find. We need to find medications that restore normal functioning so that that disease of addiction fades away and is controlled. Can cannabis itself ever be used to treat other addictive disorders? Alcohol dependence, cocaine use disorder, opioid use disorder, nicotine, even gambling. We don't know. We need to know more. Two years ago, if I were to ask that and say that publicly, I would say, absolutely not. Ridiculous. This makes no sense. Now, like Dr. Gupta, my mind's changed. I'm thinking maybe there is a potential there. We just don't know.
And again, what is the natural course of cannabis use disorder? You know, what's going to happen to these men and women who started using now, the millennial generation, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, 40 years from now? We're starting to see what's happening in the baby boomer generation, and that's the thing that's so critical to understand. What happens after 40 or 50 years of cannabis use? You know, I think that, that's really fascinating. There are things, you know, what can be learned from Marijuana Anonymous? This is a very small network of groups that are happening in Los Angeles nationally. We need to know more how to use it, what works, what doesn't work. What are the best predictors for treatment success and failure for cannabis use disorders? We know very little. When you Google cannabis addiction treatment, you get very small number of hits. You get a very small number of reliable places where you can get information. And what are the cannabis-specific treatment principles? You know, for instance, can you treat cannabis use disorder with cannabis like you do with methadone for opiates? We just don't know. So when we go back to the very basic slide, this is the five things, true or false. Again, I'm not going to tell you what I think is true or false, but these are the five principles that we actually have to look at. These are what we hear our patients talk about. This is what's driven in popular culture. This is what we see in media. We see this debate, and these are the things that we had to reverse. And so my position then is very simply, cannabis is harmless? No, it can be harmful for some, but not all. I think the vast majority of folks who do use cannabis don't develop this disorder, but for those that do, it really is difficult. No one dies from cannabis overdose, partly true, they do die from cannabis intoxication. Cannabis is not, not addicting? No, it is, it absolutely is. Cannabis does not have withdrawal syndrome. That's false, it does. But why doesn't the withdrawal syndrome happen in everybody? What's different about those men and women that don't have a withdrawal? Those are the sort of questions we want to know. Can cannabis treat other addictions? Come back to our 25th annual, in our 25th annual <laughs> cannabis symposium that'll be what, 2000 and, I can't even do the math, 42, 2042, when uh, Dr. Chen is chair of uh, UCLA Health, maybe. <laughs> maybe we'll have a lot more information. Again, I'll go back to this little bag. There's so much inside here for us to know, to know, to think, and learn. And I think it's so amazing that why we see so many people here today, because people are fascinated, because we're stumbling on something. We've hit on a touchstone here, and it's really important for us to marshal the resources of UCLA, take it to the next level. All right, so a couple things as I finish up. That's my email. Um, you know, that's the can our gambling studies program. It's the same color as cannabis. Maybe it's a foreshadowing of the kind of work we're going to be doing. But this, and I just want to say this. I know we're heading toward the end of the time. This is not the end of what we're doing. This is the beginning of what we're doing here at UCLA. So please contact myself. Please contact Jeff, soon to be Dr. Chen, uh, and all of us in the cannabinoid affinity group about your ideas, your desires, your wishes about what you'd like to see UCLA do as we lead the, the nation in research on cannabinoids and cannabis over the next decade. So with that, I'll take maybe one or two questions, and then we'll keep going with the program. So Dr. Cooper mentioned some of these that were embedded in the National Academy of Sciences talking about the greatest risk factors being male, smoking, using other substance use disorders. There are other things like having impulsive personality traits. Family history obviously are very, very important. But the basics are there. This is a genetic disease, addiction. You've got to like this stuff in the very beginning and you have to have access to it. Last uh, summer we had a whole debate here about legalization and one of the audience members said, this is just going to drive it. It's going to make more people addicted. The response from the expert was saying, it's already available. So the things that make something addictive has to be available, has to be accessible, has to be affordable, and has to be anonymous. Nothing that, specific about the choice of the substance in the respect? No, nothing I think specific on that area. Absolutely. Just exposure, yeah. alcohol? Yeah, I mean, the two biggest risk factors across all addictions are going to be family history, and early exposure of that substance to that brain. Dr. Frankel. Dr. Frankel. I'm just going to say that when you're dealing with patients with dose CBD and THC, these issues just don't come up. It's probably a different patient. 
But the one other issue that I just wanted to mention is that in a lot of studies when they talk about withdrawal issues, it's very difficult for me to understand which are the withdrawal symptoms versus which were the symptoms that the patient took the cannabis for in the first place, like insomnia, anxiety, nausea. Those are pretty common symptoms that people, you know, pick up cannabis for early in life. I think that's a great point about cannabis withdrawal because you could be taking it for the actual indication. For us, what we see is very clearly when they stop using it on a regular basis, it's the emergence of new symptoms that they didn't experience before, even before they started using. And again, it can get very puzzling. This is why, for clinicians, cannabis is a real mystery. Because, because it's such a heterogeneous uh, drug, because it does so many different things. And because men and women have such these other symptoms from mental health conditions, it makes for a very tough thing to sort out is it causing this, or is it helping it, or was it pre-existing, or what's the natural course of things? So it's so much more stuff that can be worked out. So, sorry, can you speak up? Are, isn't there an association between certain psychiatric illnesses, such as bipolar disorder um, and types of severe depression, that are risk factors for um, dependence? So the number one psychiatric disorder that would be a risk factor to develop cannabis use disorder is having other substance use disorders, so other addictions. But when we look at all the other major mental illnesses, bipolar disorder certainly rises up very high. Uh, major depression and uh, certain anxiety disorders, PTSD, social anxiety disorders. Other personality disorders, of course, also elevate that risk and, of course, untreated ADHD. So this is part of the, the struggle that we have with mental illness, as I think of it very simply. When you have mental illness and you're suffering from those symptoms and you find something available that's affordable and works, you're going to turn to that. The problem turns is when your relationship with that product goes south and develops harm or side effects or damage, that's when unfortunately this disease of addiction might emerge. Okay? One last question. One last question, yes. Thank you, Dr. Tom. There are new modalities of the taking cannabis, the edibles, the dabs. Are any of those modalities more addictive than let's say joints? So again, so much more information is, is needed. When we go back to the 80s, people said crack cocaine is so much more uh, addicting than powder cocaine. Well, partially true. They're more potent, they're certainly more reinforcing, but they're all addicting. So again, addiction is about repeatedly doing something. Now, one of the problems that we have is that when you have a highly potent drug and you get first exposure, that's when you're going to have a maximum uh, you know, biological effect, and that certainly can be what puts it up. But as of right now, we can't say definitively one form of cannabis uh, formulations are, quote, more addicted or more habit-forming than the others. Okay? Thanks a lot. Thank you, Dr. Fong. Uh, up next, we have Dr. Joseph Pierre. Dr. Joseph Pierre is a professor of psychiatry in the Department of Psychiatry and Biobehavioral Sciences at UCLA. He is an inpatient psychiatrist who was formerly the co-chief of the Schizophrenia Treatment Unit and is currently the Chief of the Hospital Psychiatry Division at the VA West Los Angeles Medical Center. He has authored over 50 papers, abstracts, and book chapters related to schizophrenia, antipsychotic medications, and substance-induced psychosis, and he is an active lecturer to hospitals and the community on the topic of medical marijuana. Everyone, join me in welcoming Dr. Joseph Pierre. All right, thank you, Jeff and Tim. I have the dubious skill of being able to cram a whole bunch of slides into a very short talk, so uh, hang on for the ride, and hopefully we'll have some time for questions at the end. So uh, I'm going to be talking about the intersection of cannabis and psychosis, which has been a pretty hot topic over the past decade or so. I have no conflicts of interest or disclosures to report. And so first we'll talk about kind of the, the dark side of, what did Tim call it, the devil's weed. I like that. Uh, so cannabis and psychosis in terms of what the risk is. We're now several decades into learning about this from research, and it's pretty clear now that early cannabis use as an uh, adolescent or earlier is a clear risk factor for the later development of a psychotic disorder. Uh, let's see. There we go. Here's a little pointer. So if you look at uh, 
any type of cannabis use across the board, the odds ratio, the increased risk is about one and a half times, which doesn't sound like a lot, but if you consider that, for example, 1% of the population has schizophrenia, if you're increasing that risk by one and a half times, that's a potentially a significant public health concern. Likewise, if you look at heavier uh, amounts of cannabis, uh, that odds ratio, that increased risk, goes up to as much as two, three, and in one study, even six-fold increased risk. So based on these, these epidemiologic studies, it's pretty clear that the risk of psychosis, that is the later development of a psychotic disorder, is a dose-dependent effect. Now, for the most part, the studies done to date uh, have measured dose based on frequency of use. Uh, is a person a daily user, for example? If frequency increases the risk of psychosis, then the other question that pops up is whether potency increases that risk. I think early in the day, one of the speakers mentioned that potency, uh, as defined by the percent of THC in a marijuana product, has really gone up quite a bit. So the effects of this increasing potency is one of the areas uh, of interest within my own ap academic work. And maybe this slide was already shown, but let's reinforce it again. These are uh, DEA seizures of so-called street marijuana, all different types, looking at the percent of THC in those products. If we take this back to here to the 1970s, the percent THC was 1%, 2%, less than 3%. By the 90s, we're into 4 and 6. And in the past couple years, we're in the double-digit range. Now, if you also look at specific types of marijuana, this gentleman over here, he's gone to, oh, there he is. He mentioned that there's different types of uh, marijuana products. Uh, could be the strain, the part of the plant that's used. So if we look at things like sensimia or skunk, or if we look at hashish or hash oil or wax dabs, we're talking about now there's products that contain up to 30%, 50%. Even when we start talking about cannabis wax, as much as 80 to 90 percent THC. Very pure products with a considerable amount of THC in them. Now, make no mistake, why do we have these uh, high potency compounds? We have them because that's what consumers want. This is uh, data looking at a survey of cannabis users, and skunk is sort of the high potency version in this study. Users say that's the best high and therefore the best value for the money. And this is despite the fact that they acknowledge that there's more paranoid symptoms when using, as well as more cognitive impairment. So uh, these are some uh, four different research studies from the same group in the United Kingdom, uh, specifically in South London, where for the past decade of, uh, or so, uh, skunk has really flooded the market. And the data there suggests that the skunk contains anywhere from 10 up to 18 percent THC. And so this research group is really looking at the relationship of that high potency use to psychotic disorders. And I'll just take you through some of these real quick. So looking at patients who are hospitalized for first episode psychosis, uh, they've published data suggesting that use of high potency cannabis, and not just regular cannabis, specifically high potency cannabis, increases your risk of being hospitalized for a first episode psychosis. The greatest risk of that kind of hospitalization or was for people using high-potency skunk on a daily basis. And again, odds ratio, about five-fold increased risk. Likewise, if you look at those daily users, the ones who develop psychosis, they develop psychosis about six years earlier than your average uh, non-high-potency daily user. So earlier onset of chronic psychosis. And finally, a more recent study by that same group, looking at relapse after that first hospitalization that relapse, the greatest risk of relapse, again, is with high-potency cannabis users. The lowest risk was those who had been using cannabis and then stopped after that first psychotic um, hospitalization. Now, why does cannabis uh, cause psychosis? This is usually theorized to be as a result primarily of THC, which, of course, is the most uh, well-known and ubiquitous drug uh, in um, marijuana, and that's thought to occur by affecting the dopamine system, increasing dopamine release, increasing dopamine synthesis, and just as a rough hand-waving theory, we know that more dopamine in general means more of a risk for psychosis. It's thought that this effect is medi mediated through THC's effect on cannabinoid 1 receptors uh, and then causing these effects secondarily. 
And so that sets the stage for us to talk about spice. Was that what you had in your bag, Tim? <laughs> um, so spice or synthetic cannabinoids, I think there's a pretty good degree of public knowledge about this, but I'll summarize real quickly. Synthetic cannabinoids were um, drugs that were synthesized by pharmaceutical companies several decades ago. They were specifically used as tools to study the endocannabinoid system. They were not at that time developed as medications. And in around 2005, these products started ending up in commercially available um, products that were sold as, quote, legal highs and branded under names like Spice or K2. We're now a decade into the so-called Spice phenomenon, and this is just from a couple months ago. Uh, there's still newspaper headlines highlighting that there's these localized epidemics of synthetic cannabinoid use. Article from the New York Times got a lot of press in December, and this was last summer here in Los Angeles on Skid Row. So if you look at people who are coming to hospital services, ERs for the most part, poison control centers, uh, who are presenting with intoxication from synthetic cannabinoids, the most common psychiatric adverse events are psychotic symptoms, hallucinations, paranoia, and then just generic psychosis. So psychotic symptoms seem to be an important side effect uh, of synthetic cannabinoid use. And less frequently, there's a growing number, a small number, but a growing number of cases reported of new onset chronic psychosis in the setting of spice use or synthetic cannabinoid use in people who previously had no experience with psychotic symptoms. So as with cannabis in general, there's concern that synthetics can increase the risk of a psychotic disorder subsequent to use. <clears throat> and so what is it about synthetic cannabinoids that perhaps makes them even more dangerous from a psychotic perspective than cannabis itself? Uh, well, THC, again, is thought to be the causative agent uh, in as much as we, we can um, infer causality. Um, and THC is a partial agonist at CB1 receptors. Well, there are hundreds and hundreds of synthetic cannabinoids but most of them are, are full agonists at CB1 receptors, and they also tend to bind much more tightly than THC does. Um, so that's, again, a, a preliminary theory as to why these drugs might be more uh, problematic with regard to psychosis. They are, in general, much more powerful. And in fact, one of the original developers of synthetic cannabinoids, a gentleman by the name of J.W. Huffman, who's a retired chemist, he was interviewed over the past several years about spice products and he has been quoted as saying, THC is a rather mediocre cannabinoid. <laughs> All right, so that's my time on the dark side. We'll talk now and shift and talk about the therapeutic potential of cannabinoids in psychosis. And if you think about it, if drugs that affect the cannabinoid system can cause psychosis, it makes sense that working with medications or drugs that affect that system in opposing ways might potentially be a treatment for psychosis. So I'll spend the rest of the time uh, looking at some of the data. So THC, partial agonist at CB1 receptors. Synthetics, mostly uh, CB1 agonists. So what then about developing CB1 antagonists as antipsychotics? Makes sense, right? Well, unfortunately, there's been a couple studies to date. All of them have been negative. So it does not look like CB1 receptor antagonists have much utility in treating uh, uh, psychotic symptoms or cognitive symptoms within schizophrenia, although you could certainly argue that there have not been a lot of studies. So uh, I said we would talk about the light side, not the dark side. So much more promising are some uh, studies looking at cannabidiol. Cannabidiol is the other major constituent in uh, marijuana. Uh, this idea got started with a couple case reports just reporting on patients with schizophrenia whose symptoms improved in the setting of taking cannabidiol. There have, I'm told, uh, been, I think, four randomized controlled trials looking at cannabidiol in schizophrenia for reasons I'm not clear on. Only a single one has been published, and that's the one I'm going to be talking about in the next couple slides. This was a study published in 2012, done in Germany. This was a randomized controlled trial comparing cannabidiol to an antipsychotic medication called amisulpiride. That medication, uh, incidentally, is not available in the US, but it's widely used in Europe. And so this was a study of just 42 adults with schizophrenia. They were randomized to either treatment with cannabidiol for four weeks 
or treatment with the antipsychotic sulpiride for four weeks. And at the end of the four weeks, looking at changes in symptoms over time, and cannabidiol did as well as emisulpiride, which again is a sort of tried and true, very often used medication in Europe. And that was true for symptoms in general, for what we call positive symptoms, the delusions and hallucinations of schizophrenia, as well as negative symptoms. <coughs> and if you look at the side effects, uh, emisulpiride did as you might expect. It had some degree of side effects like weight gain or changes in prolactin, or motoric side effects that we call extrapyramidal symptoms, things like tremors or rigidity of the muscles. Well, cannabidiol did pretty well and didn't really seem to cause the same types of side effects that uh, antipsychotics often do. So that's, again, a preliminary study, but pretty exciting and interesting. And that leads then to the question of why would cannabidiol have antipsychotic properties? It's usually said that cannabidiol does not actually bind CB cannabinoid receptors with any strong affinity. On the other hand, it's also said that it may have antagonistic effects at those receptors, or what we call inverse agonist effects, by virtue of uh, different, um, what we call all allosteric interactions at that receptor, other indirect mechanisms. In addition, uh, cannabidiol, it has been suggested, has a property called uh, partial agonism at dopamine receptors. That happens to be what many of the newer antipsychotics do. And also like many of the existing antipsychotic medications on the market, cannabidiol seems to have some uh, serotonin 1A receptor agonist properties. So it shares some of the same proper uh, activities that antipsychotics do. In addition, kind of taking things downstream uh, for a bit, it looks like THC and cannabidiol both affect these sort of major signaling pathways that are relevant to dopaminergic transmission, the flow of dopamine through the brain, such that THC may result in this sort of hyperdopaminergic state, particularly in the areas that are relevant to psychosis. And in contrast, there's some evidence that cannabidiol may do just the opposite, sort of opposes those effects, resulting in a relative decrease in dopaminergic activity in that area. Likewise, by virtue of the uh, activity, the action of cannabidiol on serotonergic receptors, it may do some, uh, exert some downstream effects that are also in opposition to what THC uh, typically does. And these are the very mechanisms that are thought to be relevant to the development of psychosis uh, neurodevelopmentally. And if we take a step beyond our traditional catecholamines, meaning dopamine and serotonin, Cannabidiol seems to do a couple other very interesting things. It's a reuptake inhibitor of an endogenous cannabinoid called anandamide. I don't know if anyone's mentioned that today. Probably. That's the, you know, people say, like, well, God wouldn't have wanted us to smoke uh, marijuana, or he wanted us to smoke marijuana. That's why he put cannabinoid receptors in our brain, right? <laughs> well, we do have endogenous cannabinoids, and the major one is this drug called, or this chemical called anandamide, named after the Sanskrit ananda, meaning bliss. So anyway, cannabidiol is a reuptake inhibitor of anandamide. It's also an inhibitor of the major uh, enzyme that metabolizes, metabolizes anandamide. And so the net result appears to be more anandamide. And anandamide is a very interesting drug. It seems to be important for modulation of things like pain or hunger and other physiologic mechanisms. And it's also thought to have some antipsychotic properties. So perhaps that's another um, mechanism by which cannabidiol might help with psychotic symptoms. A researcher in Germany, uh, Dr. Lewicki, he believes that this step here of inhibiting that enzyme that uh, metabolizes anandamide might be a potential um, pathway to develop other novel antipsychotic medications. And again, that's one of the things that cannabidiol does. So it may be that we could have other medications that uh, exert a similar effect and might have antipsychotic properties. Incidentally, there are, I'm just gonna go back before we get to that one, there are some existing uh, FAAH, uh, fatty acid amide hydrolase inhibitors um, that are, are known and, and exist. Uh, none of those have yet been studied in psychosis. So to date, cannabidiol is really the only uh, cannabinoid that's been studied. So that definitely opens the door to other research projects. The last couple slides, this is just looking at some of the pure or allegedly pure cannabidiol compounds out there. These are the kind of things you can get at a dispensary or depending on your state, down at the farmer's market. 
This one on the side here is a Pedialex, which was probably mentioned during the, the lecture on epilepsy. That's the uh, FDA-approved or semi-approved. It's on orphan drug status now, but that's the FDA-approved drug um, developed by GW Pharmaceuticals. So in as much as cannabidiol might end up being a hot drug in terms of uh, potential in psychosis, we might anticipate that there might be some competition between people who are attempting to so-called self-medicate, uh, drugs already approved by the FDA, as well as other drugs that people might be wanting to develop after they hear this talk. And finally, um, last slide, it's a little messy, but I just want you to look at this red line. So this is going back and looking at street marijuana, quote unquote, stuff that has been seized by the DEA during drug raids. And the red line is looking at cannabidiol. So I mentioned that the amount of THC has gradually increased in response to consumer demand. Well, likewise, probably in response to consumer demand, there has been less and less cannabidiol in your typical street marijuana. And so this, I think, uh, gives me my concluding statement, which is that there does appear to be some potential for cannabinoids to treat psychotic symptoms. And it definitely argues that we might want to do some more research with that. On the other hand, I would say very clearly, uh, as a warning that smoking cannabis is not a good idea for people with psychotic disorders or with a propensity for psychotic disorders. And I would echo Tim's statement with regard to psychosis, early use of cannabis is really where the problems seem to be. And I think that's my last slide, so that I'll leave some time for questions. No? No questions? Ah. Have you, have you already done studies on um, how it affects schizophrenia and psychosis? Have you done ADHD or any other? Yeah, I'm not aware of any other studies uh, outside of schizophrenia at the moment. These are both good questions. I hate to disappoint you with my answer. No. <laughs> are you aware of any uh, attempts of regulation to establish uh, baseline levels like CPP floors if we think that it might have a protective element might be able to? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. Again, I'll disappoint you by saying no, but but it really raises this question of whether, you know, A why has cannabidiol been bred out of stuff available? I'm guessing there's some people in the audience who might know that answer better than I. Uh, but it raises the question of whether or not, kind of like fortified bread, whether or not we ought to put it back in there and whether or not from a public health standpoint that might offer some protective effect. Certainly possible. Um, we know that different strains of marijuana, for example, sativa versus indica, have in general different proportions of THC versus CBD. Uh, I primarily am a clinician that works with patients with psychotic disorders over at the VA. It's very common that they come in talking about um, marijuana use, and I will often ask them specifically which compounds are you using? Are you getting it from a dispensary? Do you know the THC content? Do you prefer indica over sativa? Now, I've never gone to the point of saying, go try some CBD, um, <laughs> but it's a really intriguing question about whether or not increasing the proportion of CBD in, in those compounds or in the products that are available might have a, a, a benefit. Yeah. All right, thank you.